I believe this monument is a game changer. I think that the, the youth of today, um, particularly the African Americans, but the white ones uh, and Asians and Mexicans and everybody else who had anything to do with cotton and being tenant farmers and being day laborers can look at a monument of this magnitude with pride and dignity and a sense of respect. What do children today need by way of education, instruction, and our experience to better understand and appreciate the significance of being descendants of a cotton-picking culture, enslaved people, sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and the like to enhance their self-esteem? Why have many elders become silent about their stories and their legacy as cotton pickers or planters for that matter, their sweat equity investment in the cotton kingdom and their unselfish vision to obtain the American dream? Is it that your generation and those younger are too busy texting <laughs> and on the phone or just distracted and doing other things or is it that grandma and them, grandma and them are a little ashamed or embarrassed by the fact that they didn't get paid, they didn't get recognized, they're not being acknowledged, they're not being valued by us anymore. Why? What can I do? Well, I want to know personally, what can I do to help interpret a more inspirational message about the legacy of cotton pickers, sharecroppers particularly, as it relates to their historic contribution that stems from the shores of Africa to the cotton kingdom of the American South and on to develop global economies in Europe and the textile industries of France and Britain specifically and beyond. And what can we do collectively as a village to honor our ancestors and give respect to those who truly earned it? That interprets their narratives and their true legacies. Now, this is a hundred year, old, a hundred and two year old woman, retired school teacher, who, when I told her of the monument project, this was the expression on her face, and she just said, "Thank you, baby." And you know, there's no better feeling to, than to have the elders truly appreciate the fact that you appreciate them. And it just says it in her face. And I love, love, love this sister because, yes, she's a cotton pickle. And she's like, say, what now? you going to honor me? And she represents to me the dignity, the strength, the beauty. Yeah, she's a little tattered, so what? But she's a beautiful, strong sister who picked cotton her whole entire life. And again, it's about respecting this work and, and respecting the integrity. She showed up, like her and millions of others, and showed out and built the Cotton Kingdom. So this is what it will look like. These are our plans. I see that as me and you walking through that front gate, the pearly gates, if you will, for cotton figures. And to, again, acknowledge that this is on a 20-acre complex, and this is how we enter. On the outside is a community gathering spot, but I see a lot of spirits in here. I see a lot of energy that kind of reflects, if you will, just the spirit of the ancestors just being there and, and present with us. And to just have that energy, I think, is going to be very, very important and very critical to the success. And of course, this is another way in which we celebrate the community with farmers markets, which are pretty rare, unfortunately, in the Mississippi Delta. Mm -hmm. You don't see much of what I'm sure you all have, an abundance of farmers markets, fresh fruits. It's a food desert there. So we want to bring 
celebratory atmosphere with the band, the blues, the spirituals, whatever, jazz, and fresh foods to make and redefine soul food <laughs> as something that's sustainable, organic, unprocessed, mm -hmm. and living foods. That's going to be the new soul food concept mm -hmm. that we come up with. Here is the 20 acre um, layout. And this is the entry gate right here. So as they enter, here is where we will interpret the African narrative. Because enslaved Africans came over with the skill of cotton. We brought the seeds. We brought the expertise. And it's like that story has never been really fully told in our history books. I've never read that, have you? Mm -hmm. Anything about the enslaved people being skilled and experienced and even bringing over the seeds with them from mm -hmm. Africa. The seeds are not indigenous to the American South, but they are to Africa. Here is where the reenactors will be mm -hmm. alongside a full life-size bronze sculptures. And they will come alive and they will tell the story. They will do the interpretive uh, narrative with them here. There above is the story and the interpretation of the planter society, the aristocratic society, and beyond. But what did the planters contribute to the cotton kingdom? Over here, we go from the system of no pay in slavery to a system of very low pay as sharecroppers. Mm -hmm. So what's that narrative all about? And then finally, we have and we see the success of black farming and um, the farming industry overall. All of this is encased with bricks of honor. We call it legacy bricks. So everybody's family who's a part of the cotton kingdom or the cotton system throughout the South should have their names a part of you know, their ancestral names are part of this monument site. This will be a water treatment, and this is the 30 foot high sculpture of a man, a woman, and a child carrying cotton sacks. And beyond that is the museum and interpretive site. Why cotton? Well, cotton was the essential reason why the Civil War was fought. Did you know that? Who in here did not know that? Yeah, it's interesting. We're not taught that. It it's, it's blows my mind as well. Who was to maintain and control the economic resources of slave pig cotton? The whole reason for the succession. And cotton is not indigenous to America, South, as I said before, but it is to Africa. Cotton became the number one economic driver in America for nearly 200 years, due in large measure to the expertise of the enslaved Africans. And again, 200 years, all industries combined, none of them measured to the profits that were made through cotton. Mm -hmm. For 200 years, all industries combined did not measure the profits that were made in cotton. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Cotton became known as white gold, giving rise to the cotton kingdom in the Mississippi Delta and the global cotton empire enabling trust funds to be generated for several hundred years, even still to this day. Many of you may be a trust fund yourself. We're trying to raise $26 million, so if you are one, send us a check. <laughs> Cotton provided the financial footing for Wall Street, New York City was one of the main beneficiaries of cotton. Shipping and railroad distribution centers in New Orleans, the Carolinas, and along the eastern shores, and for British and French colonial textile industries. Entire families worked together from kin to cane. Anybody have any idea mm -hmm. what kin to cane means? No? Kin. Any guesses? Hmm. You can't see the way you can't. 
Of course, your professor knows. <laughs> <laughs> it's from can't see in the morning to can't see at night. So they were loading up on trucks and mules and however they can get there and, and, and trying to make it out to the grill. Um, families tended to have more children in order to help out in the fields, and each had a quota. We're going to meet a gentleman later on that actually had to pick a bale of cotton, 500 pounds of cotton, every day at the age of 14, or he would be beaten by his dad because they had a quota. If they didn't pick the, the bale of cotton, his quota, uh, they would be basically displaced or kicked off the plantation. Schools were closed during picking season, and hence the education still today is compromised in, in our communities down south, uh, particularly among African Americans. It's become a part of the culture, the compromised educational systems. African cotton. Historically, cotton in most parts of Africa was a subsistence crop that grew in the gardens alongside vegetables and other crops used for sustaining food, clothing, and shelter, and not necessarily for capitalistic and exploitative gains that evolved through the slavery system. Now, this is a very, very important quote that Ralph Ellison shared with us. And that was his own reflections about this narrative. And it's basically saying about this family in 1862, I'm not ashamed of my grandparents or ancestors for having been enslaved or sharecropping cotton pickers. I'm only ashamed of myself for having at one time been ashamed. What are some of the things that you know other than cotton that grew in the cotton fields, like the culture, identifying some professional people are folks who were once cotton pickers or experienced that life. Uh, what cultural contributions can you readily identify as having grown out of the cotton fields? What about the origins of blues? Can you identify where that may have come from? The real true origins. <coughs> yes? Like the pain that they were suffering? Yeah, yeah. But see, and to your point earlier, mm -hmm. Madam President, um, <laughs> you know, when the, the misery got so deep and so strong, you know how people, they get into a moan, you know, a groan to just relieve that pain. And for the African peoples, what they did was recall memory from Africa, from Mali, from Burkina Faso, from Senegal, Ghana, wherever they came from. And that sound is still very present today in African traditional sounds and traditional African rhythms. So the origins of blues itself is an African rhythm, is an African memory, if you will. And so it's, it's what they needed to evoke to soothe themselves from that pain, that torture, of, is what we clearly have seen in those images. It must have been pretty painful to be out there all day long from Ken to Cain, picking cotton. Can you imagine? And that's what your ancestors did. And I'd say all of us as Americans, the world, global societies really owe a deep debt of gratitude to those folks who picked cotton and who planted it and who made the cotton kingdom become what it became. So, you know, all of this, again, New York was one of the main beneficiaries of the cotton kingdom and the cotton exchange. Overseers, working class, whites and blacks, uh, the workers were enslaved, skilled Africans, Native Americans, Mexicans, European immigrants, Asians. Uh, they were sharecroppers, tenant farmers and day laborers. The distributors, of course, for the railroad, the international trading and shipping companies, and all of us wear the fabric of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. Cotton is just mm -hmm. the number one thing that we all have worn and continue to wear. And yes, it is. It's the fabric of our lives. 
Now, why in the world did we choose Mount Bayou as the place where we should build this national park? That, in and of itself, is a huge presentation, a book that should be written, a movie, if you will. But Benjamin Montgomery, this man's father, was the person who actually ran Jefferson and Joseph Davis's plantation called Davis Bend right outside of Vicksburg, Mississippi. So while Jefferson Davis was forming and becoming the president and the first and only president of the Confederacy, these men were running his operation. They were signing the checks and issuing the currency as we saw earlier, but it was all being managed by Benjamin Montgomery, who was an enslaved person, but they didn't like to call them slaves, they called them servants. And so it, it's a very, very interesting um, narrative about Davis Bend and how, in fact, Benjamin Montgomery, Isaiah T. Montgomery, ended up owning Jefferson Davis's plantation and ran it um, themselves under their own ownership just after the Civil War. Hmm. And so they, they owned it for about 20 years, and then they lost it due to taxes and flooding and, and the lack of cooperation of their neighbors. So what ended up happening is that when uh, Benjamin died, his son went on down the road and negotiated a deal with the railroads and, and started a brand new all-black town called Mountain Bayou. The beautiful thing about Mountain Bayou is that it was a black collective and very cooperative society in which they developed a huge uh, economic uh, center that was like the capital of the black world and an example for how to work cooperatively coming out of a situation like slavery. And here we see the early settlers clearing uh, the wilderness. And from its early beginnings as a raw settlement carved out of the Bolivar County wilderness, Mumbai became a place of black refuge in the hostile world and a laboratory for black economic development. Huge narrative about Mount Bayou. Historically, it had the railroad station where the neighboring planters would bring their crop because if they had the Mount Bayou stamp on it, because of the historical um, expertise, if you will, of, of the Montgomery's and their ability to grow premium cotton, the best cotton, they would win competitions throughout the South come in first place for their, uh, for their quality of cotton. They brought that expertise with them to Mount Bayou, and if the neighboring plantations had the Mount Bayou stamp on it, it would increase the value of their shipment. So people would come to Mount Bayou, the white neighbors and everyone else would come to Mount Bayou to have the stamp that would increase their crop load. This is what the railroad station looked like back in the early 20s, and then this is what the house looks like today. It's currently a resident. There's a lot of historical preservation that still is going on in Mount Bayou itself. There was four cotton gins. These are the three that currently um, are still there as relics. Mount Bayou became known as the jewel of the Delta. And as the village grew and its commercial establishment expanded, the town leaders called it the jewel. Booker T. Washington described it as both a school and an inspiration. President Theodore Roosevelt thought it to be an object lesson full of hope for the colored people. Negro capital of Mississippi, Mount, uh, Montgomery's community, the vibrant example of a group economy in which black dollars circulated in a closed black economic order. We've gotten support from virtually everyone that we have approached with the project concept. The city itself uh, has issued resolution. This is the second of uh, as many resolutions by the mayor and the county and everyone else that we ask. They all are in major support, including our state United States Senator, Thad Cochran. Um, he, along with every other political affiliate to Mississippi and our region has issued letters of support. 
our congressman has just delivered a miniature statue to the president, President Obama, and you'll see that in a minute. But yes, the list is growing, and even the director of the National Park Services, Dr. John Jarvis, has issued a statement saying, it is time, because we have done nothing to honor and celebrate the people of the Cotton Kingdom. This is a front page article that appeared in the Clarion Ledger, it's the Jackson, Mississippi uh, newspaper. It was the front page of a Sunday edition. And so this was pretty huge, it was a big deal. And so they sent the whole article and posted it up on a beautiful poster board, or, or actually that's a wooden frame that they sent it to me. And this is the miniature statue itself that we sent to B.B. King who was our honorary chair, and he passed away as our honorary chair, as did Maya Angelou. She passed away as our honorary chair. So this is uh, what the statue, the 30-foot high statue, will look like. And this is the one that we sent to the president. So our expectation is that this will be in the presidential library. The next time you see the statue, it'll be in President Obama's library, wherever he chooses. If it's Honolulu or Chicago, we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. but. Look for this. <laughs> the community outreach thus far, again, we have had Dr. Maya Angelou as our honorary chair, B.B. King as our honorary chair. Currently, it's Bobby Rush, who is one of the major uh, blues artists from Mississippi. He says he's the biggest blues man in Mississippi, and B.B. was the biggest blues man from Mississippi. So. <laughs> And the list goes on. We're going to add Drew University to this list mm -hmm. if you don't mind. Of course. <laughs> Ed Dwight. Again, if you don't know him, please Google him. He is the man <coughs> who has developed 130 monuments throughout the country. He was the lead designer on the Martin Luther King monument and on the um, square, on the what you call it? On the plaza, on the mall. The mall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until they outsourced it to China, but he was the man who came up with the initial concept. We have done a series of sweat equity investment symposiums, which started four years ago with Mississippi Valley State University. This is a cover of the program. This is what the second annual poster looked like, and the third, which was done by Mississippi Valley State students, this particular one. And this year, which was just last week, we held our fourth. And the theme was cotton quilts and freedom narratives because during the Underground Railroad, mm -hmm. during the time during enslavement, they had all kinds of very sophisticated systems, code systems, if you will. You hear it in the music, in the spirituals. You know, Go Down Moses mm -hmm. and all these other spirituals that would send messages. They were also encoded in the quilts. The Underground Railroad, the mapping system was encoded in the quilts. And only those people who knew what was going on would know what to look for. And so there was a complete mapping system on the trail that you should go and the, and the landmarks that you should look for in order to find your way through safe passage to the north. So that was the narrative and that was the theme this year. Now, so far we've collected a huge range of um, cotton picking narratives is what we call it. But one of my favorite and our marching artists essentially is the one that came from Maya Angelou and I'm gonna read it for you. She said to us, scarred, rough, chained, black hands full of fluffy cloud-like white cotton, a poignant picture of American history we have all come far, former black slaves and former white slave owners, all trying to live free and fair lives in our American present. We have far to go. But let us be proud that we have come this far with courage. We must not be crippled with guilt, nor with hate. It is imperative that we remember our history, for it is true, one who does not learn from history is doomed to repeat it. This is a very special man. 
Mm -hmm. He's my father, mm -hmm. and he was a cotton picker. I'm going to tell you a quick story about him because how I got and how we even started with this whole process was because I brought home to him in San Francisco something I thought was a gift, something I thought was special, something that I, you know, just a little numb in the Delta. You know, he's from Mississippi, but I had no idea of how he felt about cotton. And I brought him a little souvenir, which was a cotton bowl, right? And I put it in his hand, and he's had, he was blind by this time because he had lost his sight to diabetes. So he was feeling it, and he was trying to figure out what it was, and then he said, what is this, a sock? A handkerchief? What, you brought me a handkerchief from Mississippi? And I was like, no, Daddy, that's cotton. Ah! When he heard it was cotton, he screamed and threw it, and it hit the ceiling, and then it was all of this, like, oh my God. What happened? Why are you so traumatized by cotton? I had no idea. And the thing about it is that he's not from the Delta. He's and his family, he's the only child, and his father had land, and we still have the land in the family. So it wasn't as desperate as I think the experience was in, in the Delta, but still, he was traumatized by cotton. Mm -hmm. Which made me wonder, well, what the heck happened with cotton and our people who, who worked it? And the deal is, is that people are still mad at cotton today. Honestly, traumatized. So that's what really kind of stimulated this whole idea. We gotta do something to say thank you, to honor these people, to, to celebrate that work because they truly did work with the vision and an understanding that the future is gonna be different, it's gonna be better, we're just gonna do the work because it needs to be done. But please take the opportunity to dig a little deeper in this narrative of cotton and what it was all about and what it required for us to have the economic wealth that this country currently has. It hinges on cotton. It hinges on this very narrative right here. Now, this is the gentleman who decided to become a blues singer. And he sat on my kitchen counter at the age of 96, actually it was 95 when he picked this for me at my kitchen counter. And he picked some cotton. But hence his name, Honey Boy Edwards, he avoided picking cotton um, by just hiding out in the day because if he was seen, he would be classified as a vagrant and taken to prison or taken to a cotton field and forced to pick cotton. So he would hide out at different women's houses and hence his name, Honey Boy. And uh, he just ended up becoming a blues singer and would perform for the workers at night when they came home from, from work. But that's David Honey Boy Edwards and he uh, was fortunate enough to live to be 96 years old and the oldest blues man alive at that time. This is the gentleman who, at the age of 14, would be beaten every day if he did not pick a bale of cotton by his dad because of the quota. The plantation system, post-slavery, required them to pick a certain amount of cotton, or else they would be displaced off the plantation. This is the king and me. Yes, even the king of blues, B.B. King, was a cotton firm. And this is Ed DeWine, he's a little guy, but he's a giant in my mind. Mm -hmm. And this was at our groundbreaking for the monument site. This is our national spokesperson, Mr. Clifton Talbert award-winning author, specialist on the whole historical backdrop and the story of cotton. And again, cotton remains the number one export worldwide. It's still major. When I say the fabric of our lives, it's not an exaggeration. We just don't hear too much about it. And you wonder why. Because it's so much pain associated with it perhaps, but it just says and gives 
significance and substance, really, to the argument that we must build a monument that respects the contributors or the contribution of our ancestors globally. Those in the textile industries of Europe as well, who worked like slaves producing the fabrics that were generated from the cotton <coughs> throughout the, the Carolinas and, and the whole cotton kingdom down south. This is the way that we feel that we need to do it in order to raise the $26 million that I know you have a check that you can write for $26 million, right? <laughs> Who's going to write the check? Yes! <laughs> what better way to preserve the legacy and say thank you than to place a brick in honor of your ancestors and mine? This we do so that they may be a permanent part of the memorial complex. So, now is the time to say thank you again. We must honor them. We must remember again the work that has gone into making your lives what it is today. Just honor them and say thank you. And again, um, I thank you for inviting me. Specifically to do this project. And um, how it happened, really, I was riding down the, the roads in, in, in the Delta, it's the Blues Highway along Highway 61. And there are these steam um, energy, uh, it's like waves of heat that would be bouncing off of the land itself, which was just open field where cotton used to grow. And I asked my partner, you know, what is that? You know, it just looked like energy to me. And he said, Oh, we used to call those dancing monkeys. I said, but you know, it looks like the spirit of ancestors or the energy of the ancestors. And it was as if one of them actually jumped on my back or got in me because I just shouted, we got to build a monument. And that it was from there that it was like, and again, so I don't take any credit for this. It's more like, you know, you become a vessel, you become you become a vessel to receive certain energies and to do certain work. And you have to listen to those forces around you to just be obedient and do the work. And so that's, I just feel like this is the work of the ancestors who, again, deserve it. And no one is doing it. It's, there's nothing on this level or to acknowledge this work at all, anywhere in the world. And so I just feel very honored to have been that, to be that vessel and to have received that message. Yeah. Do you have like a time frame or maybe like a specific year that you guys would like this all to kind of be like up and running or is it just kind of depending upon like your funds and everything else that kind of falls into place? It does depend on, depend on the funds, but we have projected 2017. Much of this has just been held back because I was working on the PhD. Um, I needed to get the story right. I needed for it not to come from an emotional place or a place of anger or a place of, you know. But it needed to be from an informed place of research and understanding and digging deeper. I've never picked a piece of cotton ever, ever. So I don't know what that life is or what the experience was. And again, to see my father react the way he did Again, it's like, wow, really? You know, and again, I'm from San Francisco. And so to be in Mississippi Delta is a whole new world for me. And to then hear the first hand, you know, doing all that primary research is, has just been so my eye opening and life changing. And so I just wanted to make sure we had the story right and didn't exaggerate anything and, and it's true and honest you know, in, in the delivery of this interpretation. So that's where it's been. And so now I've just finished my dissertation. It's all about this. It's all about building uh, this monument. And so it's a PhD in public history. I still have to defend. Uh, I'll be defending in January. 
So that's that's what's been holding it. And so now we're ready to really just push forward and get this thing done. Well, I don't